Eric. Omar. So we have a little bit of a controversy here. When don't we? I know what they're going to say. What they, capital T, what they will say. What is it? Well, one uh, interesting comment. I used to get this sometimes on my YouTube channel. And these are the more amusing ones. I like all the ones about like the banter, the this and that. Or they say, please get to the topic. And to them, I say, hey, Kai, shout out to him. Timestamps. Check it out. We're taking the 10 minutes. But sometimes it would be about like personal appearance. And there was a comment where someone said, uh, did Omar get Botox on his lips? His I lips saw that one weird. too. <laughs> bro, uh, you know, Eric, you want to hear something? Funny? You would find this amusing, bro on my youtube channel when it was getting just a lot of you know it, it actually would be 60 percent strangers 40 percent like subscribers i'd get shit like bro why are you wearing mascara why are you like you bless like this and that and as eric knows i only wear mascara on special occasions but they need to wrestle with the fact that you know if you're pretty you're pretty but it amused me because i haven't seen a comment like that in years you're back on the rise. People back are on looking rise. at you. They're not even listening. They're so <laughs> distracted. Yeah. I uh, I had a, you, you know, my, it's a, it's a picture I use in a lot of my, uh, like, appearances or, or whenever I give one to people. It's me standing there in a black 3DMJ polo mm -hmm. with clean cut with my, uh, <laughs> with, with short hair. And I got this one guy who was adamant that it was photoshopped. And I was like, it's. Like, what do you, I, it's not even a shirtless picture. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, it's pretty clear. And I was like, I mean, it's, it's not. <laughs> and I normally crop it to like, to make it a headshot. Sorry, so I, like, I don't understand. Job, bro. Like, so, like so photoshopping what, uh, you know? So it, it's funny. And then there was also a period like in 2016 to 2018, where there was a dedicated couple comments who were trying to figure out what was going on with my hairline because yep. it wasn't consistent between videos. Yep. And I'm like, well, sometimes I have a haircut. Sometimes my hair's come back. Yep. And then sometimes the angle is is higher or lower. But I have had a you know a similar receding hairline for a while. And uh, but we've Eric. we've stopped the we've stopped the recession, folks. So <laughs> yeah, the that global recession we cannot stop. The hairline, on the other hand, let me just say you can't help it. You have a chiseled jawline, and if they can if they cannot accept it, we'll be on the Mount Rushmore of. I was going to say fitness, but who really cares about that? The Mount Rushmore podcast, because folks, listen to me here. We're going to read another rating review. We've had a few. I only read one because there are a few points I want to touch on, some funny comments. We appreciate everyone. Apple iTunes is where we tend to read them because as far as I'm aware, I could be wrong. I don't think places like Spotify, you know, has a repository of reviews. So that's why we read it. We're not, uh, you know, endorsed by them. But this one you'll like, Eric. <clears throat> This is another kind of science-inclined episode, but uh, this review, this podcast keeps getting better. Steve, having listened to a variety of lifting podcasts over the decades, the show is the best. Whew, five stars. As an old history teacher that loves to lift, the episodes featuring Connor are a real treat. Now I'm going to go find some heavy rocks out here in Western Canada to go lift. Shout out to BC. Shout out to you, Steve. Come on, Eric. Hey, we get a lot of love from Canada because we give a lot of love to Canada. <laughs> Let's be fair. Yeah. Uh, the number of times that we've had Canadian guests on might slightly misrepresent their overall demographics in the global population. Yeah. It certainly. almost seems like 80% of the world is Canadian if you listen to Iron Culture. Um, especially with me becoming, uh, you know, head coach for the team Sheffield team. Canadian team. Yeah. As well as, uh, you know, uh, part of the coaching staff for Worlds and Malta just to you know, a few weeks away. So I haven't yet received my Canadian passport, um, but I know that mail takes a long time to get from Canada to New Zealand, it's especially nice. by, I assume they put a, mo a moose with a mail pack yeah. on a ship. And they're not that big. And it has to get out here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So. No, and I will say shout out to Steve, because one thing I appreciate, Eric, that we do, we try and do those deep dives, things that we're passionate about. And we know that for a certain portion of the listeners, they'll also find it intriguing. And then, yeah, we got to do big science. Yeah, we're whatever. <sighs> Told that someone's atop the ivory tower and we're shackled to do these informative ones where all we want to do is lift heavy rocks in random places and revive cultures and traditions. But nonetheless, Eric, the last episode, speaking of which, someone said, 
the Greek Trojan. Speaking of history, let's just go off on a 30 minute tangent about that. Uh, love Eric Trexler. Shout out to the Trex. It'd be neat if you actually started podcasting one these days. Wouldn't it be? And wouldn't it be kind of neat if our boy would be returning as part of the new mass cast? Remember, folks, there was that announcement that we're now going to be bringing the combined forces of mass monthly applications and strength sports, of which Eric is one of the founders and one of the people doing the damn thing. One of the four, right? One of the fearsome foursome. Eric's like, that's not what we say. <laughs> but yes, go on. Um, well, technically, there yeah. was three founders, but oh, yes. currently it is there are four reviewers and four there has reviews. been a slight change of the guard. We got Lorna Colenzo simple now on, but... But mass at its core is uh, is a unified strength of, of 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 I don't know champions. Does that sound good? A unified strength of champions. I'm throwing random the, words to uh, that sound good. Champion champs. Mass cast is happening, folks. Yeah. Mass, so tre- so Trex is going to be back, and also stay tuned. There will be more from the mass crew, uh, and I'll, I'll just leave it there. But we got that going on. And then someone said, oh, where's the banter from the last episode? Why no Eric uh, trash and Derek? And I saw you left the comment, Eric, I love. I just can't help but love the guy these days. Shrugs. Like, are we are we in our peace and prosperity arc of our, like, if we're a manga, where are we, Eric? Well, he's not even a, like, an ally anymore. He is, he is, he is, he's no longer an other, he's an us. You yeah. know, he's not a them. Mm-hmm. Um, as much as, you know... It's, I mean, it's, people can understand my position. If you yeah. come into the fitness industry yeah. and you go, hey, I'm a bodybuilder, I'm a powerlifter, I'm a coach, I'm a scientist, uh, and my name is Eric, yeah. it's pretty clear that you are intentionally choosing to, you know, shoot shots at me. And when shots yeah. are fired, I'm a bus back. So, yeah, he got called Drexler. He did get called the macro factor guy. Uh, we did have some minor spats with Stronger by Science, but... He's on our podcast now. He is part of the mass cast. So. And, uh, you know, what's the way that, 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 that people connect best? It's by fighting. Yeah. And I think that's, the, we, we've learned that over the years. Um, if my experience in middle school can extend to life, which it probably shouldn't, but um, I'm not very mature, so it does for me at least. He's the boy now. Yeah. I'm going to give respect on his name. It's Trexler, not Drexler. How dare you? Anyone who's ever said that, besides me or you, is on my shit list now. His yeah. name is Eric Trexler. You get it right. In fact, it's Dr. Eric Trexler. <laughs> and I do want to issue a public apology because, you know, you come at Eric, I'm going to get riled up. And I did Either some... one now. Y- yes. Yeah. Oh, let, let's be clear. Helms or T-Rex, okay? Um, and I did some preliminary research a little bit of scoping out into his origins because it, it's kind of it's quite vague and he would say hey that's Omar because I was born in the pre-internet era and I said what are you really hiding and I mm. heard from a, a non-credible credible source that his original name was Derek Drexler that's what I heard Eric and I came with you and then in fact he changed his name to the much more sensible Eric as a means of hopefully some people confusing both of you you know like oh natural bodybuilder PhD evidence-based practitioner, Eric, Eric, you know? So like, we're I'm not, not going to endorse this that. one. Yeah. I'm not going to endorse this one. I yeah. think this is fake news. I yeah. think this is the, uh, this is one of those things that gets repeated, Omar, and unfortunately you get sucked into a bubble. Yep. This is like the, the you know, the birthers, like show me the certificate I need to see that it actually says Eric Trexler on it. And um, I guarantee you, I would, I would bet at least $2 and maybe 50 cents that his name on his birth certificate was Eric Trexler. Might have even had doctor on there because he's that smart. You know what I'm saying? So I think we need to put those rumors to rest because they are just that, rumors. Yeah. Um, And uh, anyone who repeats that, Mm. you're in the doghouse for Iron Culture and Mass Cast, which are conjoined. And then lastly, there is one longer comment I want to uh, read, which it's a drinking game, the Iron Culture official, unofficial drinking game <laughs> I've from seen a few this weeks one ago. Too. Yeah. So I'll just read this one quickly, folks, and then we will begin the episode. So if any of the, the, the following are uttered or these uh, things therein, you would take either a shot or a drink, a sip. Uh, so the first is not to completely derail this, and then one completely derails this. Two, for reference to not being brothers, not being lovers, but instead a secret third thing. Accurate. Three, <laughs> the homie Jess Bittner, which we both say, hey, look, look, 
We want to pay her respect. What, friend, you would say what? Like client, like so, my. So those athlete. first three are the, are, are the Omarisms, right? Yeah. 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 Now, what do you, I have you said the homie? Uh, I, I don't think I have said the homie just, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll have to now yeah. and then take a shot, I guess. The homie. Okay. And then uh, Omar reveals an increasingly eccentric area of interest. Now, I will say I would, I would fight back against eccentric. I think the word it you're appears, looking for. Appears. I think it appears increasingly eccentric, but yeah. really what it is is that you have just not fully shared your depth of culture until we actually made a safe space and literally put culture in the name of the podcast for you. And we're all appreciative that you're opening up and sharing who you are more than you used to. Wow. What? Now that is, that is a moment, Eric. I, I was just going to say, so eccentric kind of has the implication to me of it's kind of weird. And I would say more like esoteric where it's like, uh, it's like specialized knowledge or interest that a niche people. So like, if you bring up like whatever Tarkovsky, the uh, uh, film director, or you bring up like uh, a certain book or like Charlie Parker's like the people that know that I've gotten DMs, like the people that are about those things are about it so it's more it's esoteric as a like eccentric sound like oh it's quirky like that per oh they like that thing it's like no it's just you know for you eric you go all the way in right it's sometimes your interest you're sitting down shout out to hype train uh when we're in ireland and you're sharing with him some of your hip-hop picks and i would describe them as just being a little bit more esoteric because it's specialized you're deep in it right it's not like it's not like oh eric like you're eccentric oh you're weird for liking that when you go deep you go all the way in I'm going to agree with you on 90% of topics, but I did actually oh, no. hang out in the car while you shared a bunch of hair metal music and discussed the cultural implications and uniqueness of it and, with Connor. Uh, with Connor. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in some cases, eccentric may be an accurate description. Yeah. <laughs> like, like the amount of knowledge and depth and number of songs you had specifically related to hair metal. Yeah. I'll give you that it's esoteric. It may be another word that starts with E and ends with <laughs> centric. Hey, uh, now I, I'm going to finish reading this and we'll begin. But shout out to Connor, because if you remember, bro, and uh, you see, you're far more sensible than I. That's how I got sick. You said, Omar, you should really get some sleep. We've had no sleep. So I'm just going to take this car ride with Connor. Don't worry about it for three hours. He said, Omar, I hope you don't mind. I, it calms me. I have a hair metal playlist I like to play. And I said, go ahead. And then I started naming every song within like the first, because I, like pay, play music and i know that genre and he was impressed so we started sharing that and yes we spoke about david lee roth's uh, uh eat him and smile but the version that actually is all in spanish poor spanish spanish is like spanglish and his foray into trying to expand that market the secondary markets of rock but yes yeah so that that is the specifically what i was thinking yeah, of yeah. when i thought it was eccentric because <laughs> we're on a three-hour car drive yeah. i slept for like the first hour and a half Woke up for 15 minutes, hair metal, went back to sleep for another 30 yeah. minutes, woke up, and then it was bad Spanish hair metal. And I was yes. like, this is a little eccentric. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very fair. Very fair. Right. Uh, so to finish this, um, not to name names, basically names names. That also might be me. Um, but then uh, this one is yours. Eric fucks up the author's name, but recites minute <laughs> details of a seven-year-old study from memory. So two things. I do fuck up the names a lot. Um, and it does appear that I have this encyclopedic memory, but what people don't realize is that I'm looking at a computer screen. Don't, so don't ruin it. Many, many times I don't have to rely on an encyclopedic memory because that really only extends to like protein and autoregulation. Eric's done it in person. He's being humble. Anyways, and then lastly, nihilism. Nihilism was a nihilism. Uh, and then bon bonus points, uh, like take an extra shot if they forget how many times a guest has been on, which is also completely fair. Yeah. Honestly, this drinking game is dangerous if you do it while listening to Iron Culture because you will be in the hospital getting your stomach pumped within 10 minutes of each episode in most cases. So accurate. Well done. I like that drinking game. Dangerous, but accurate. Yeah. And we, uh, that's uh, what we want to say. We appreciate every single one of you. We're very excited for this year with all the things that we're endeavoring to do. And we're kind of bringing it full circle with maybe the topic today, a preliminary one, right? We're, we're kind of, we're just scoping it out because I was speaking with Eric about something happening in, uh, on social media, in our space. And that would be, there seems Eric, like there's an increased prevalence towards some younger lifters in particular, uh, the source, probably TikTok, And I, I no joke, uh, when I say that I don't mean anything by that, but it's the easiest way for something to be transmitted these days, quickly disseminated to the masses. I, I don't know from whence it came, 
but I have certainly seen this over the last several months and it only seems like it's growing in popularity. The appeal of people training to failure, but more particularly, not just that ephemeral, like, oh, I train or I train hard, like we're speaking about before, but in particular, one person, Mike Menser, and his style of lifting, high intensity training. And there's a lot, there's all these memes now coming about, like, you know how they used to talk about, uh, you know, whatever, like training for strength and like when you think you hit your max, but you got 20 more pounds. And that's, you know, that's a meme, like that was a meme from a few years ago, things like that. And then they fall uh, a certain form. But I have uh, witnessed now some of the uh, kids vlog, and I do say kids like 20, 21, 22, uh, speaking about how they're shifting up their training style to incorporate more training to failure. And anecdotally within the space, I'm certainly seeing more people, of course, it's self-report, like we're we uh, break that all apart, um, how they've been training to failure and how they've been getting better results. And it seems like, Eric, kind of like, I'd say not that training to failure is akin to the low-carb diet, the nutrition equivalent, not that at all, but just it's one of those concepts that is part of the bedrock of lifting and will always be there. And certainly things work kind of in cycles where, you know, a topic, you'll think it's either dead or people have discussed it and then it'll, uh, you know, gain popularity again. And I would say right now, it seems to me, and so that's why we're just talking about first the concept and then also a little bit about the research you're going to get into training to failure, resurfacing, and then that identity uh, 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 as being someone of a hard worker. Like you're someone who actually applies themselves. You put in the yep. work in order to get the results. And it's all told through these cultural memes of creating like, you know, snappy videos of, you know, this, that, like this person thinks they're training it hard. Here's a training to failure. And there's all these videos, Eric, of kids. And it's one thing I should say, the optics are sensational where someone that's, uh, you know, uh, training a failure or training hard, their legs are shaking, their face, they're making all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, contortions with their face is that it's visually appealing. So one, yeah. I have to say just from a marketing standpoint, the idea that, hey, this is almost me submitting myself for the approval of others. This is what I'm doing to show you guys I'm working hard. So there's a bit of that performative aspect, but nonetheless, I could say, I would say with, you know, <sighs> Yeah, I'll stick my rec uh, reputation. I do think it's a, a thing amongst the youth right now. Training of failure, it's the increasing. Youths. What the youth? What's going youths. on, Eric? What, what what's going on? What have you been seeing? First off, you've been training a little bit longer than myself. You've seen things come in waves. Um, uh, first, from a cultural standpoint, in terms of the amount of people that adopt more of a uh, you know closer proximity to failure in terms of their training approach and one of the uh, key features of their training. Can you talk about that, the cultural aspect? And then, of course, we'll get into like the science and the research and where it currently stands as it relates to training and failure. Yeah, man. So uh, next, or actually when this episode comes out, we'll be really close to my 19 year anniversary. Yep. I'm very soon to no longer be a teenager <laughs> next year when it comes to my, uh, my lifespan as a uh, lifter. So I'm becoming a little more wise. Yep. And the first thing I will say is that TikTok is an overall younger demographic, yep. which means that just the probability that any given TikToker has been lifting for a long time is relatively low. Mm -hmm. um, and even those who have been on TikTok for a long time, they know they're appealing to a younger audience, which means their audience are people who have not been lifting for a very long time. And I think it is a natural focus. Um, of any time you get into a new thing that you're excited about to fall in love with it and get obsessive about it and excited and just go all in. And that is an amazing thing that enables you to put a whole lot more work into it. When you're passionate about something, uh, what someone who is not passionate about it ex in comparison experiences is very different. So if you love um, history, Going to your history class with an engaging teacher and assignments that you're engaged in, getting an A is easy. If you are someone who hates history, you will have to work three times as hard to get a C. And that's just kind of, not not for everybody, like that may be a, an influence of my own personal experience and maybe my little bit of ADHD kind of hyper-focus and all that stuff. But nonetheless, um, I think that is what we're seeing here to some degree. Yep. And I don't think, depending on what is rewarded in a, in a, in a, in a culture, it's not necessarily a bad thing, yeah. right? Cause the typical thing that is rewarded on social media that is harmful is you need to look like this to be accepted, to be normal. You have to be really, really strong. You've got to look good all the time. Uh, you've got to always be hitting PRs. You know, there's, there's 
strength and hypertrophy versions of this. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that we're seeing on TikTok, which is, you know, a demographic of younger people newer to lifting enamored with busting their ass and training hard, yeah. right? And I think some of this stems from just the desire to make rapid progress and do everything you can because you're really in love with the idea of bodybuilding. And that leads to what can I do today? Like, yeah. what, what is it? Russ, Russ is a clothing brand, Get Better, Get better. Today or something like that? Oh, yeah. he rebranded it, Eric. It's now oh, called my bad. Better, <laughs> FYI. There's no today, there's no, the temporal aspect of it, better. So you just have the clothes and you're better. <laughs> yeah. I like. <laughs> um, so yeah, talk, talk about a status symbol there. Uh, the clothes is literally named better. Can you imagine like driving like a, uh, a car and like, <laughs> bro, I didn't even so intend to do like that, a, Eric, I apologize. And, I didn't even intend to do that to you to make you derail this one. Oh, I, I can't even help it. So like, instead of like having a Gucci bag, you just have like this, this bag says I'm better. Anyway, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'm, I promise Russ, if you're listening and I know you're not, we're not taking shots at you. I just found that funny. I know you're um, the hardest work in the room, bro. Don't worry. We're talking about training and failure here. A hundred percent. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay, stepping away from from that from that derailment, I think it is totally normal when you're early on in your training career to figure out what can I do right now to optimize progress. So mm -hmm. you either do all of the volume, all of the exercises, you go to all of the proximities to failure or pass them. I did the same thing. Most people I know do that. Yep. And it's not a bad thing, right? And if I I what I've always loved about the powerlifting community and the bodybuilding community generally is that to be a respected member of it, putting in the hard work in the right communities is respected more than the end outcome. And if you're not hanging in a crew where that's the case, get out of there because there's plenty of people who don't view it that way where it's not all just you know a means to an end and if you look great, you're a good person and if you don't, then, then you're shit. And that's obviously a terrible bankrupt worldview. So, and I don't think it's at the essence and the core of, of, of what lifting is about. It's about pushing yourself and finding your barriers and, and realizing they aren't your barriers and pushing past them. So all of that is very good, Omar. I don't think it's a problem. Yep. I think it's interesting that people have reached back into the history and, and connected with Mike Menser. And I also kind of like that because it means they're at least aware of what came before. Um, I think some of Mike Menser's stuff are eye-rollingly hilarious. Like he has a quote which there was a member on the bodybuilding.com forums back in the day. He used to keep it at his signature. I assume facetiously, I, I assume ironically. And the quote was, it only takes one bullet to kill a man. So why would it take more than one set to, uh, <laughs> to stimulate muscle growth? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. It's one of those things where if someone really, really has already bought in, it can like subvert your critical thinking. Be like, yeah. And like, what, what do you mean? Yeah. Like, it yeah. only takes one hour for 60 minutes to pass. Why would it take more than one set to failure to make a muscle grow? Yep. It only takes, you know, one toothbrush to brush your teeth. Well, like, like you could say anything and it means, yeah. it means literally nothing. Yeah. So, um, so just the fact that that is something that Mike Menser thought was a good idea to say, I think tells you a bit about maybe, uh, some of the philosophies behind it. But that's not to say that it's not a viable way of training yes. and that there is going to be increased buzz about it as we get more and more data on this. And of course, it is an important factor, you know, obviously making sure you train hard enough. So um, I think there is complexity around what is quote unquote training hard. Um, and people who have tried to oversimplify it, I think have had have done a shockingly poor job of, of misinforming people and yeah. not being helpful. And there is this kind of meme belief that everybody is not training hard enough. So just saying train harder, which obviously means something that everyone understands, um, should be done. And if you're not doing that, you're just a pencil neck who's over, over complicating it. Um, so I think that's totally false. And, uh, I think it takes like at least three minutes of thought to realize that to be the case. Um, and yeah, that's a little condescending of me, but come on, you know, like, that, that that's what my experience has been in the trenches over 19 years. I've seen plenty of people train as hard as some of the biggest people you see, and they're not making progress. And I've seen plenty of people do things that this community would see as training less hard, and that being the key to them unlocking, you know, uh, 
you know, gains. So it, it is obviously a more nuanced topic than that. You don't just get to pick and choose the anecdotes you like that align with your, your prior beliefs. That's how you maintain a bias. So I, I think the data is actually quite interesting in this area. And it is very telling that the people who are pro-failure, they'll latch on to analyses that support their position and they will dismiss analyses that don't. Um, and I think a much more healthy view, as always, is to just maintain a flexible belief system that is updated based upon the data and its limitations. So, yeah. Eric, I cannot wait for you to do this deep dive. Folks, it's official. It's a monster episode. Brandon, lights, woo, woo, woo. The ever-changing background that I have. Eric's a steady Eddie. He just has, he's in his house. It's like, why is Omar constantly changing where he is? We don't need to get into that. But one thing I do want to touch on, I want to shout out, uh, first off, 3DMJ, because I know uh, Alberto Nunez, as an example, he posts his training vlogs, and you can actually see from someone who's been training for a long period of time, what training hard actually looks like, that, like that, that word, you know, taking something to one or two RIR, same idea with you, when I was training with Alberto, when he was down in Toronto yourself, the one thing, and that's the cultural aspect I want to touch on before we actually talk about like the data, the research, training and failure within the context of one's training program, hypertrophy, strength, all those uh, nuances there. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a the cultural uh, aspect that people latch onto. It's almost, there's a certain contingent of people where it's like performative failure that appeals to them. It's their submission in terms of how much effort they're applying as a means of getting validation. Look how much I'm trying towards this thing. And I think that association where people will draw it also with, you know, lifting in general, Eric, where they'll say, like, train harder. It's kind of an analogous to like, oh, you want to make more money, just work harder. And it's like to a certain point, it's like, but if you have your, you know, your credentials, let's say you're a construction worker, a nurse at this or that, you can only work so many hours in the week. Oh, I've already maxed those out. So what are we actually talking about here? Oh, you want to attain, uh, you know, more compensation. It, it, it gets more complex very quickly. Um, so I think for some of those individuals where we see the idea, I would, I would call performative failure, where it's more an identity than a cohesive system of beliefs. And that's why you're joking around. Shout out to now the deceased uh, Mike Menser. Um, some of the things that he would say. And I think those almost become, bro, like a gateway into how people self-identify with someone. So like maybe his, uh, 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 how do you say, Ayn Rand, like I know he was uh, like heavy into that, like Alice Shrug, like ob objectivism. Um, they see that and like the worldview and it conforms to that. And then they're training to, it's like a natural extension, which in and of itself, there's no condemnation for me. Like whatever gets you to buy in and you enjoy this thing and you're sharing with others. Cool, 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 cool. But I do think as you're going to get into, a, a, as it relates to the research, when we actually define like training to failure, what does it look like, RIR, and what the research shows, it becomes intensely fascinating, especially within the context of, you know, every single person, what their goals are. But there's that whole separate side conversation of people that identify as training to failure enthusiasts and then what their set and rep quality uh, looks uh, looks like. And sometimes this is my own personal bias, uh, not, not against that, in terms of some of the people that are in that camp. And I am thinking specifically like Alberto, because I trained with him. Well, when he was in Toronto, I've certainly trained with you. I put you guys in the exact same category that training the failure is more sometimes an identity than an application of a methodology. And what I mean when I say that is that when you do it as an example, I know you, I know you're like at a legitimate one or two RIR, which means Eric only has one or two more reps in the tank. Same idea with Alberto. So you could say like an RP, RP from like nine, but he's not shit. He's not yelling. He's not screaming. There's once again, no, none of those contortions in his face. If anything, I'd say as it gets more difficult, and that's not to say that you can't do those things, you become more focused into the actual exercise itself. So you're trying to like lock in. And so to an outsider, yeah, the velocity of the bar, the bar or the dumbbell, or whatever is slowing down. But like if he really applied himself, Eric, like if Alberto really applied himself, he could probably get like one or two even more repetitions. And it's like, no, that's not how it works at all. Whereas some of what I'm talking about specifically, and this is the final point here, with some of those TikTokers of people where they'll film themselves, there is that performative aspect. It's theater because you have an audience, intended audience, and you're almost convincing yourself that you're training harder than what you are. Instead, if you really had that intention behind that set and you're completely focused and so you're focused on the execution of every single repetition and just trying to get you know as many as you can or whatnot, I personally feel from what I've observed that some of those people, what well, seems like they're training to failure, they probably could have squeezed out a, a few more repetitions. So it's almost like a pat on the back 
of what they need, or it's an element of perhaps a masochism. So that's that's a separate side conversation to the research of training a failure. But it's been my experience of those that actually apply themselves within their training. It sometimes looks different than what like a novice or an intermediate would assume it looks like. Yeah. I, I 100% agree with all of that. This is ground we have covered in, in Iron Culture before. I think absolutely the responses you get when you say anything that could be conceived as anti-failure, you get what feels like political opinion lashbacks as if you were to put a politics post on, on a social media post. Um, and it is always surprising to me um, whether it is like why we re recently when we were promoting our anniversary sale for mass, um, Trexler made a really good post about some of the data on failure. And there's this one study where they did volume matched and trained individuals. And there didn't seem to be a benefit of training to failure versus training further from failure when volume was matched. And this is just one study. Um, but as we'll discuss it, it, it comports with most of the data. Um, perhaps as we get a better understanding of the nuance of the data, uh, it would, that that might change. And we might understand that failure is a little more important in specific contexts for, for specific outcomes, which we'll talk about. But man, some of the responses in the comments, they were like people who didn't, they didn't want to read it. They said like, oh, so this is on untrained individuals. And I was like, no, it was, it was on trained individuals. And like, oh, how many years of training they had? And like, well, okay. So they had, you know, on average four and a half years of training experience. And they were like, oh, well, this is clearly small sample size research. And I was like, no, it was a within subject design. So one of their legs did this and the other one didn't. And, and someone else is like, oh, well, this is just individual effects. I'm like, no, no, no. It was their left leg and right leg. Like, just don't, don't just say things. You can ask the question, you know, but you clearly like, I don't want to believe this. And yep. here's the, the first reason that popped in my head, Yep. you know, rather than being open-minded and looking, oh, this is interesting. Why did this happen? You know, which is where learning occurs. So it, it was, I, it was a surprising number of people who just felt like maybe this, 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 these study findings, which are pretty agnostic, um, like gave them a bad day and they, they needed to, to have this very reactionary, uh, post on, on my Instagram. So it was almost this interesting cultural experience for me because I, I, I don't have an identity. I mean, I do have an identity as a bodybuilder and someone who trains hard, but that's been a part of who I am for, like I said, almost two decades now. So it's not performative. I don't need to display that. I have convinced myself that I can push myself very hard. I know there are probably some people out there who can push themselves harder than me, but I'm always working towards having the ability, not just any day I'm in the gym all the time, getting amped up and pushing myself as hard as I can, but to do what's necessary to put in the work to get the outcomes I care about, right? And I have pride in the fact that I can work just as hard as, as most other pro bodybuilders and high level powerlifters, albeit with a less impressive physique and less impressive numbers, but I can hang. And, um, and I have been given props at times in my career as someone who works very hard in the gym. Tough. Um, so it's like, I don't need that to be a badge of honor that I wear on my sleeve all the time. I, I don't have any problem with people like you said, who have that badge of honor. And I think it's probably a better badge than other options. Sure. Um, but I think if that identity, like you were describing it, which it is for many people, unfortunately, is actually getting in the way of you learning, then that should be something that you look internally about. Like, oh, I'm, 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 I'm like, just in my own head with, uh, with, with this, with this, this, this understanding of this concept, and I'm not really open to it being different because it scares me and makes me question my worldview or personal identity. And it's like, you know, you're, you're a more complex person than how hard you go on your, your, your set of dumbbell presses. So like basically chill the fuck out. Right. Is is kind of honestly, my, my, my opinion, this is, this is lifting weights. Right. And, and then like the other response you get is this is being overcomplicated. You don't need to think about this, Yeah. <laughs> which I think is also a fear-based response. Like people need to work hard. All right. Don't, don't start studying things until tell them maybe they don't need to work as hard. Cause that's, that's a bad message. Okay. The children are going to be hurt by this data. You know, <laughs> it's like, shut up. Like nobody is in anybody who's out here reading my post about a meta analysis or a study on failure. They're not the people who need to be like, like concerned about how hard they're working. Okay. They're, they're, they're in They're They're part of the community. So it's just funny. It's like, it's it's almost like the, this the scared neighborhood watch in a gated suburban community because someone in a hoodie walked by because I posted and I was like hey, you guys calm 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 down calm down everybody calm down yeah 
So that's all of my uh, my response to to what you were saying. The main thing I will say as far as the data is that the data has evolved. And I do think we're going to see more popularity and potentially for good reason for training closer to failure yep. and more viability of it and a better, more nuanced understanding of it. Um, but I am not the person who I think is best to speak to it. And I'm really looking forward to potentially getting Zach Robinson on. There's mm. a new preprint that's out. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know what a preprint is, and they were not there for our episode on open science with James Steele, Milo Wolf, and Dr. Pack, a preprint is one of the most important tools for open science, where you say what your methods are, what your findings are, and you basically put out the manuscript prior to peer review publicly so that you get feedback from people. They tell you things, they bring up concerns, and then you can address those things before you even submit it to peer review. Because peer review is a mixed bag. You know, you might not get a, a great review. You might get an uh, incorrect review. Uh, you might just kind of get a, 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 a once over. At the very least, a preprint does two things. One, it ensures that you do get some peer review at all. Um, it opens it to a very kind of communal uh, perspective. I've been talking to, to Zach about this. And I know other people interested in this field have. Um, and the other thing is that it ensures that someone else who is considering doing a future study, because there's such a long lag time before something gets all the way through peer review, thinks about, okay, what can I do if I was going to do something similar? That's because this happens all the time. Let me do something complementary rather than redundant, mm -hmm. right? Um, not that there isn't value in replication. So anyway, uh, this, this is a preprint. It means it has not gone through formal peer review. It may change. Uh, the data, to my best understanding, look accurate, but there's actually some pretty complex statistics in this. So I can't claim that they are, like, I, I'm just not a statistician. I, I am sufficient at stats to, to, to not feel embarrassed. But anyway, preprint, you, uh, one of the most common places to put them uh, is on uh, sport or rxiv.org. Uh, and uh, it is titled Exploring the Dose-Response Relationship Between Estimated Resistance Training Proximum to Failure, Strength Gain, and Muscle Hypertrophy, a Series of Meta-Regressions. And one thing that I love about this is that the final author is our very own Dr. Zerdos from Mass. And anyone who's talked to Dr. Z or read his articles knows that his take on the data is that training for strength or hypertrophy, you can get effective outcomes actually training a lot further from failure than most people would expect. Mm. whether that's a, you know, like five RIR training, he does not predict that would be any better than training to failure, right? And um, we had a pretty interesting bonus piece of content in mass where myself, Zerdos and Greg kind of had a back and forth and we all had slightly different views on this. And I think that's because the data are not super, super clear. And Zerdos expressed that he was probably the most skeptical of the value of training to failure mm. and more on the side of, you know, I think it makes sense to limit failure, to limit fatigue so that you can train more frequently uh, and with higher volumes um, and, and and potentially higher intensities as well, or higher loads, I should say. And this makes sense because, um, you know, Zerdos does come from a, a powerlifting background, heavily science-based. But this specific meta series of meta-regressions that Zach led Zerdos' PhD student, and that Zerdos was a part of, it actually contradicts some of uh, Zerdos's, uh, not all of them, but some of Zerdos's beliefs. So I think it really speaks to the fact that um, a good scientist follows the data rather than trying to look cool by making a, a, a guess based upon partial data and then wanting to kind of hold on to that so that they don't look wrong which is really the anathema to being a, a good scientist. Um, and this is also true of myself based upon this analysis. It supports some of my beliefs and not all of them. One thing I thought was really cool um, was that they specifically found the effect of going to failure uh, as less beneficial at higher loads for hypertrophy than lower loads. And there was something I said in our back and forth with Greg, and I'm going to quote myself here. <laughs> Um, just to show how right I was before the data even came out. <laughs> um, I've long speculated based on EMG data showing peak activity at 80 90% of 1RM that perhaps at a certain load threshold around maybe 80% of 1RM or so that failure is a lot less important that the total amount of work performed over that threshold might become a more dominant factor. 
So that's kind of how I viewed things. And and sort of, this is kind of obvious. Like this isn't like, oh my God, so smart. And how did you know before the meta regression came out? Like, yo, if you're doing an 80% of one RM load, you can only do six to 10 reps with it. So you're starting at, at the maximum RIR of, of nine, right? Which is already relatively low, considering if you're training with like 70% of one RM, you might be able to do 20 reps, right? It's like already doing your first 10 reps. So anyway, um, that that's not a, a pat on my back, but it is... It's cool to see that, okay, my, my overall conception of probably how things work does seem to, to line up. Now, before I get into the full results, that was just a little teaser to make me sound smart, which is always the way you open on things. You establish your credibility, and then everything you say is, is seems assert correct. Assert dominance. Assert dominance. Exactly. Dominance you assert intellectual dominance. That's right. So this is actually the fourth meta-analysis I'm aware of uh, that includes hypertrophy uh, on, on failure. There's another one that was also on strength, but didn't look at, at, uh, at, at hypertrophy. And they've all been relatively recent. And we have talked about a few of them before. So there is the first one I was aware of, which is by Vieira and colleagues. And that came out in 2021. And that's the effect of resistance training performed a failure or not failure on muscle strength, hypertrophy and power output. And their finding for hypertrophy specifically was that when you did not equate for volume, training to failure was better. But when you equated for volume, that effect went away and became non-significant. Um, now, the interesting thing is when you actually look at the forest plots, it is leaning of maybe a bit towards failure. Um, but, but I mean, it's hard to say. And I think an important point is that, that at that time, there was like five studies being meta-analyzed. A further step uh, was done by uh, Schoenfeld and Gergic. And I think there was also some other authors on that as well. And what they did was a meta-analysis that included more studies. So that was also Orizem and Sabol. And that is the effects of resistance training performed to repetition failure, non-failure on muscular strength and hypertrophy, uh, a systematic review and meta-analysis. First author was Gergic. And they had more data and they found that when looking at studies on trained individuals, interestingly enough, there was a small positive effect, but overall there was not necessarily a significant effect. And that was not necessarily volume equated when looking at that sub-analysis comparison on trained individuals. But again, we're seeing this very small effect, okay? And an important caveat is that the vast majority of studies on training to failure are understandably, because they're done in the lab, training three or two times per week. And they're with what most people would probably describe as moderate volumes. So it's not necessarily surprising. Um, the second most up, well, I, I should say the most up-to-date peer-reviewed meta-analysis, because this, this preprint has not gone through peer review yet, is one led by, uh, who's been on, uh, soon to be Dr. Ruffalo. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. so working out of, out of Melbourne, um, with Lee Hamilton and, uh, Jackson Fife, as well as myself supervising him for his PhD. So shout out to Martin. And uh, this was a really cool analysis because we started to drill down more into these differences. And that's what we're getting with more and more time is more nuanced to this discussion. So what we specifically did was we looked at different definitions of failure, because that is a big issue. That one, what one person says is failure is not what another person thinks. And that goes to that kind of thing of, oh, do you really know what failure is? And this is an issue in the research as well, but it's far more controlled and it's not really as much of an issue as people think it is, at least in the lab setting. And there is a term called momentary muscular failure, which is when the person actually cannot complete the concentric and that's been confirmed and they've been motivated and pushed by the people around them. And they often need spotters to, for safety, depending on the type of exercise used. And the really interesting finding here was that when you're comparing uh, non-failure versus momentary muscular failure, no significant difference. And when you compare non-failure versus set failure, which is any definition besides momentary muscular failure, often called volitional failure or RM training, repetition maximum, it's not to say they weren't training hard. They probably were training to failure in the most, most cases, but they weren't actually failing necessarily. Sometimes they were. That was almost significant. It was 0 0.077 and the effect size was, was what we would call small. And when you collapse all of the data together in that meta-analysis, there was a significant effect, barely. P equals 0.045. Mm -hmm. But again, the effect size of what we would classify as trivial. It was just under 0.2 uh, for the uh, like the mean. And the confidence interval extended all the way down to zero. So what that means is that, yeah, it, you might get a little something out of training to failure more, but it's certainly not a requirement. 
And it doesn't seem, at least from this analysis, which is what's changed in the preprint, that there is a, a greater benefit of getting even closer to failure. Mm. Because volitional failure seem to be more consistently better than non-failure than momentary muscular failure. So that was where we were at until this preprint came out. And the preprint is, I wouldn't say it's contradicting these findings, but it is providing a new level of nuance. And I think that's pretty cool. So what the cool thing that this preprint did is they only included studies where they could estimate RIR. So either they used an RIR comparison in between the groups, uh, or they were able to estimate it via various metrics, okay? And then they did a bunch of meta regressions. For those who don't know what a meta regression is, a normal regression is just simply plotting the relationship between two variables, right? So if you were to plot a regression of height and weight, you would see a positive relationship between them because generally as people get taller, they get heavier and be a strong relationship. It wouldn't be perfect, of course, because there's you know heavier people who are shorter and skinny people who are tall, um, but it would be pretty strong, right? So a meta regression is when you take a bunch of studies that have compared the same variables and you plot all of them together like a meta-analysis. It is part of meta-analysis. And what they found is actually quite interesting. So for strength, they found no relationship in their meta-regressions between proximity to failure and enhancing strength gains. And in fact, a negligible negative effect, which it, it probably is not even worth bringing up because you wouldn't notice it on an individual level. And it is really about load. So the take home we can have there, and by the way, these are all volume equated, either same number of sets or same total repetition volume. So the take home we can have there on the strength data is that it is exactly what we'd expect from the principle of specificity. You want to lift heavy weights, you train heavy. And whatever the proximity to failure is, is a side effect or a byproduct of lifting heavy. If you train with 85% of one RM and you do two reps, you'll be at a four RIR in most cases because you can probably only do five or six reps, right? And it doesn't really matter, okay? So it does seem that the principal thing that's going to influence strength gains is lifting heavy. Volume is, of course, important, but not nearly as important. But proximity to failure does not seem to be a huge variable there. And that's exactly what we've seen in the strength training community. You've got people who do a whole bunch of doubles, singles, and triples in the 75 85% of 1RM range. Or you've got kind of the west side group who does max out. But again, they're only doing like a single at 95 97% or going for a new PR. And they'll both be at the world championship level, right? Yeah. And that I think makes sense. The really interesting finding, and there's two aspects that I think the failure crowd will one like, and then one very much dislike, is when you look at the relationship between training to failure on hypertrophy. Mm. And there is a linear relationship, but then gets exponential. It gets disproportionately beneficial the closer you get to failure. So when I just say that right there, Mike Menser crowd is cheering and they think they've got the convert of Helms. They're going to get the Helms bump or at the very least they've, they've dismissed the science crowd as these pencil necks who are wrong this whole time, destroyed by their own hand in this meta analysis. Right. Um, but what they're not going to like is that it's not a massive difference, although it is disproportionate. Like if you look at the, the slope, it, it goes up as you write when you get from like a two RIR to like a zero RIR. But if you look at the confidence interval, you're getting a positive effect. You are growing muscle, even when you're at like a 10 RIR. <laughs> so it suggests that yes, training to failure is important, but you can absolutely make gains when you're pretty far from failure. And that is basically the basis of why Zerto's had these beliefs is there's so many of these studies, like when you look at uh, velocity loss studies where they're terminating sets at 10 to 20% of velocity loss, and it's only slightly worse than terminating sets at like a 25% or higher velocity loss. Like, yeah, you get a little more gains, but the meme of it's only the last two reps or, or the, 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 the grindiest reps that actually do anything or the kind of the old school, very simplistic, effective reps model of it's only the last five reps that do anything. It's like, ah, it seems more like it's like the last 10 reps that do, that do stuff. And that's probably even further for some people, especially if they're novices. So... That's pretty interesting. And I think it is just really important if people do look at this preprint, which you can look at the whole thing and you can see all of the various uh, graphs. And they even have some good ones near the end where they've just cut it down to 10 RIR and lower and looking at hypertrophy. And they've looked at moderators. There's, a, there's like a really well-written paper and there's a lot of interesting findings. And I think when you're looking at the hypertrophy findings, when you just cut it off at 10 RIR, 
it's important to think about what does the standardized mean change, which is like the, the, the effect size, the hedge is a G, which is a type of effect size. Like when you're all the way back at a 10 RIR, you're looking at like a 0.2. And when you're all the way up to going to failure, you're looking at like a 0.4 something. So it's, it's, it's more, but these are both small effect sizes. So this is why the anecdotes aren't necessarily super, super, super clear. Um, so that's interesting. So two things, you can grow muscle being a lot further than failure than some claim, but being closer to failure does seem to be better than being further from failure, potentially all the way up to the point where you're not actually hitting momentary muscular failure, but you're actually hitting like a zero RIR or a one RIR, which is right around where that estimate seems to go like, like higher. So those are two things that I think are difficult for people to wrestle with having at the same time. Yes, going to failure is important, but it is not this life altering experience that's going to change everything for you. And if you weren't making gains, it's because you were training at a five RIR. And now if you go to zero RIR, it's going to change everything. It might be a little bit better. So that's, that's, that's like level one, that's layer one. I think the second really, really important layer here is to understand what was meta analyzed here. What was meta regressed? What studies were included? And so, so first I would encourage people to look at figure eight. That is the 10 RIR relationship where you can kind of clearly see that that slope going up. But then what I would also encourage people to look at is the, and also figure, uh, figure nine, which is a different type of fit for the model, is to also look at what were the characteristics of the studies that were included. And when you look at the frequencies and when you look at the, uh, the number of sets per week, it's quite telling. So in figure one, you can see on the far right frequency in terms of the sessions per week per muscle group, and you can kind of see the distribution. And there was a handful of studies where they, I think like six or something like that, where they're training each muscle group once per week, a few more where they're training each muscle group three times per week, but the vast majority of studies, they were training each muscle group twice per week. So that's important to know. Uh, another thing is that the vast majority of studies fell between doing four to 12 sets per week per muscle group. So what this really tells us is that with moderate volumes or low volumes, with a moderate or low frequency, it's probably a good idea to take it to the house and train to failure. But there were a lot of moderating variables for hypertrophy. So anyway, what, am I, what do I mean by a moderating value? So statistically, when you look at a regression between two variables, this is just simply increases in indices of hypertrophy and proximity to failure. That's just a simple, you know, univariate relationship. When you want to see what moderates that, you can plug a whole bunch of these other variables into the equation. So when you plug in load, when you plug in how do you calculate volume, different types of volume equations, whether it's sets, reps, volume, load, et cetera. Uh, when you plug in frequency, when you plug in, like I mentioned earlier, this is the, the teaser finding, the percentage of 1RM. When you're actually closer to failure, it seems to matter less for strength, for example. Um, when, you plug in, when you plug in biological age, training age, sex, they plugged in all of these. None of them made the relationship stronger. Most of them made it a little weaker, which means that when you start to pull other levers in your training, training with potentially higher volume, uh, doing multi-joint exercises, doing things that might induce a little more fatigue, pushing sets up higher. The relationship is still, still holds true, but it gets less clear and less favorable for training to failure. So this is not necessarily groundbreaking information, but I think it does give a little more credence to the idea of, you know, if, if you want to be better safe than sorry, uh, it's probably not going to hurt you to train to failure if your goal is hypertrophy. But if you are doing something like I'm really pushing set volume on a given muscle group or a given day, or I'm doing a lot of compound exercises, you know, you get a lot out of doing a two RIR or a one RIR, and it may not be worth it going to failure based upon the data we have that going to failure does disproportionately increase fatigue. There's a meta-analysis by uh, Viviera on that. Um, there's a study that was recently published by Ruffalo and colleagues. That is well-established as well. And it's important to note that, okay, in this preprint, in this meta-regression, that didn't shake out to the point where it actually negatively impacted hypertrophy. We have to acknowledge that. But this isn't necessarily a meta-regression of the type of training 
that people are doing. Yeah. Most people are training four times a week or more. The vast majority of people who listen to this podcast, if I had to guess, Omar, I would say 90% of our, our listeners probably train at least four times a week. And the other 10% are training three times per week. And they're, uh, I'll say 9%. And there's maybe a couple people who train less frequently than that. So I think that is, that's really important to keep in mind that the studies in this meta-analysis, the number of days per week they're actually training is almost always three or less. Mm. So it's these like completely or almost completely unoverlapping groups in terms of frequency, which is going to have knock-on effects on volume. So the true application, if we wanted to go, okay, what can I take directly from this meta-regression and, and, and state is true and apply it, is that on average, if you were going to be training three times per week or less with, you know, volumes that were, you know, moderate and, and, and maybe not too much higher than that, say maybe not higher than like 12 sets is where my confidence would, would start to fall off after that per muscle group and probably no more frequently than training each muscle group twice per week, it's probably better to train to failure. And it's funny you brought up Berto because that's basically what he's doing right now. He's training with a low set volume three times per week and he's training upper body twice and lower body once because he has a more dominant lower body. And he's taking most of his sets pretty damn close to failure and typically the last muscle group to failure. And one thing I will say, like if we want to have a vindication for the trenches, it's not necessarily training to failure because I don't think this is super new information and you still have to rectify the fact that a 10 RIR still grows muscle. Um, the thing that we can say is vindicated is probably the bro split. Mm, and that's mm. not just from this information, but I would say it's also from our increased information on training frequency, where we went through that period where we probably jumped on the bandwagon too quick, uh, collectively as an evidence-based community, based on a couple of meta-analyses that were on a few studies, where we went, you know what, higher frequency is independent of volume, better for hypertrophy. And now the nuance is actually, when we're looking at these higher frequency studies for hypertrophy, it's it's an effect of higher volumes. Could be something there for for strength, maybe because it's ex, you know repeated exposure and you know more more time spent learning in a, in a high quality state. But hey, low frequency is okay. Low being one to two times per week uh, for for a muscle group, uh, not once every fortnight like uh, our dear Mike Mentzer actually got to eventually. Um, <laughs> that that that's probably indicated is is actually a negative. Sorry, Mike. Um, R.I.P. But still, a relatively low volume compared to the kind of the, the high frequency, high volume renaissance, you know, saying six to 12 sets per week, training each muscle group one to two times per week, and maybe stacking all of those things in one to two sessions and training to failure, that's basically the bro split. And I think it is probably, it makes sense when you think about it, that so many bodybuilders landed on that, um, especially with the advent of machines, and especially with all the identity and culture related things that you talked about, Omar considering that it is not a bad approach. We cannot say that a, you know, a six day per week push pull legs or a four day per week upper lower or a four day per week full body where you spread things out is necessarily better than a bro split. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, think, I think that's just something we have to rectify. Ultimately though, and Berto just did a video about this on the 3DMJ uh, YouTube, and I would really encourage people to do it, that if you're starting with picking a split and that's how you base your, your programming, you're probably still in the infancy of programming. Because really what you should be doing is choosing all the various exercises that are best suited to your muscles, because that's what we're trying to train, thinking about appropriate dose, which is the combination of proximity to failure, load, and repetition range, and then thinking, okay, how am I going to distribute those across the week? And your split is an effect of your programming rather than the first place you start. And I get that that's an intimidating process for people if they're not familiar and have been in the gym for a while and have thought about programming and it's easier just to go, fuck it, I'm just going to do a four day upper lower. And that's great. That's a fantastic heuristic. But I would just encourage people if they take their goals seriously to start doing like inside out programming and mm -hmm. actually thinking about what do I need and what's the, the optimal way for me, personal preferences, schedule, my own observed individual response to spread that out. And then just knowing that they have the freedom to have a lower or a higher frequency. And if they like or feel they personally benefit from training closer or further from failure with higher or lower volumes and higher or lower frequencies, that they can do all of them. And that indeed, 
if their principal goal is hypertrophy and they're not pushing crazy volumes or crazy frequencies, it's probably better to actually go to failure based upon this research. Again, preprint, not peer reviewed, that may change. All caveats apply. Uh, but I think this is really interesting findings. And the big take home I want to say to people is I'm not the expert here. I would love to get Zach on uh, as well as some of the other co-authors. Eric, incredibly well done. I cannot wait for that episode that will be happening. And you, as you said, shout out to Zach, Data Driven Strength, uh, James Steele, Mike Zordos, who we may have had some of these guests or all of them on before to really discuss this new uh, in preprint uh, meta analysis. But I, th I think you did a very thorough job. I think there's a few different uh, points to touch on right there. One, I was going to do a skit and I might revive it. And that is, as you said, that relationship, as you get to a lower RIR, as it starts increasing, so it goes from linear to increasing in terms of the uh, dose response, um, we can't just stop at failure, folks. We have to actually go beyond failure because what it didn't plot was a negative RIR, right? So you fail, okay, you've given up, but keep going past that, okay? Let the person assist you until you physically cannot do anything further, until in fact, you shed your corporal flesh. And I'm not advocating for that, but beyond failure is maybe now that we've seen this relationship, Eric, just a side note of that. But I will say that I think, I, I really like how you put that because one, from a time efficiency standpoint, if you only have a certain, or, or maybe let's say that's your preferred training style and your limit, like a rate limiter for you is you could train X number of days per week. Well, two to three times and you have a certain amount of time to do it. It is by far one of the most time efficient ways to train. Um, two, I will say that I was not uh, to Mike Menser or RIP, as you said, um, I actually applaud and you're speaking about or bro splits, man, the the real world in the trenches of kind of applications of some of these things and the willingness for a lot of serious lifters to experiment almost, as you said, Eric, to the detriment of their own potential progress. Like as you're talking about with Mike, maybe at the end of his career, where he was training every fortnight, like a, a muscle group, but just the idea that because we're so hungry to acquire more results, we're willing to experiment. And that's actually where we derive some of the, you know, the hypothesis that then are tested down the road. So no shade whatsoever. The third aspect too, man, is just to say that I think it is, especially for people who've never played any sport activity, any uh, sort of physical activity and really push themselves. I think at some point, and you said about yourself, myself included, when I started training more on the strength uh, side, shout out to what side, uh, where I had Sean take me through it. The idea that you need to know not what your limit is, but the idea when people talk about training and failure, what does that look like? What does that necessarily entail? Um, and then to the other point, uh, you know, now that you know what training and failure is, the whole estimation of your RP, like these things over time as people self-organize and they choose their particular training styles and goals, uh, being able to correctly analyze your training becomes very important. And there's one point I want to touch on, Eric, after with you, the idea that as you have uh, sets with higher uh, um, total amount of repetitions, uh, people, especially novice and intermediate mm. lifters, as they try and estimate and how this like kind of making a foolproof, well, if you go closer to failure, it kind of eliminates that. Was that a 12 RIR? Was that a 15 RIR? Was that in fact a 5 RIR when you're doing 35 reps? But the last thing I want to say uh, real quickly, man, all these people train to failure. I wonder, you know, not that I believe the anecdotes where someone will say, Eric, oh, I started training to failure or whatever. I, I did this and I got better results. Very possibly, right? It, it, the individualized process, what else were you changing up? But I think it's almost like a secondary effect sometimes for some of these people in the sense that when you make the choice, okay, I'm going to switch over to a, a new style, like a new training methodology, your overall intention behind that training is you buy either A, into this new style, but then B, what you do outside of that. So everything, well, I'm going to make sure I hit the gym on time at a more optimal, like I'm going to train in the afternoon. I'm going to train uh, uh, after work's done. I'm going to make sure I hit my protein. You're just more focused and then tensionality is higher overall into what you do. Then you apply yourself because for a lot of the people that are talking about training to failure more frequently, I would put forth, this is my uh, bet, man, that they're training more than three times per week. It, it is more like four or five times. Yeah. And it's, it, it's a good amount of sets. And if in fact they are getting better results, I'd say one of the things is that I think sometimes when you buy into a new style, 
how you apply yourself to everything surrounding that increases and you're yielding results that you're attributing towards one thing that could be something else entirely. But without getting too far off topic, man, because I think you did a thorough job. And as you said, we'll have Zach on uh, and maybe some of the other authors, the co-authors on there. Can you talk a little bit? Because one of the points, one of the most contentious areas, uh, Eric, and you said uh, you brought that up, the whole idea of RPE, that once someone's been training for a long enough period of time, and more specifically, my slant's always maybe a little bit more inclined towards strength, that people are pretty damn accurate at estimating their RPE. So what's the rate of perceived exertion when they do a set? So when they self-rate, but then something else is also brought up, Eric, almost counter. So this is like uh, one of the, how do you say, uh, extra issues brought up by some people advocating for training to failure, the, the general idea that people really can't estimate how hard they're training. And they'll bring up some ideas that if you train in higher repetition ranges, then you know you think you're at a 2 IRR, uh, or IR, so you think you're at an RPE 8. But are you actually, are you closer to an 8 or a 9 because you're doing 30, 40, whatever, or even 20 rep, let's lower it down, 15, 20 repetitions. What's IRR? So can you just give a little commentary on this general concept of estimating one's own effort? And I think that's, that, that's one of the central points here. Yeah, and I think this there's actually some really interesting data that when I talk about it, people are going to think that they conflict and be confused, but I can explain exactly why they seem to conflict. So we can start with the, the data that really is a win for the RIR pro community, and that is a meta-analysis that was done by Halperin in 2022, early in the year, titled Accuracy in Predicting Repetitions to Task Failure and Resistance Exercise, a Scoping Review and Exploratory Meta-Analysis. Um, this is a really cool meta-analysis where the principal finding was that the mean error in all the studies where people have been asked to estimate their RIR, and the way this is done is you'll be mid-set, calling out how many more you think you mm. can do, and then you're motivated and you go all the way to failure to where you fail and you're spotted by the uh, the participants in the study, and you look at what's called the RIR difference, okay? Um, and the average error on that task failure was under predicting the number of reps. Oh my God, the, the failure crew is right, by 0.95. And the full confidence interval is 0.17 to 1.73, which means if if we could somehow sample everyone in the world and do a study on them, that mean might fall somewhere in there. They could be is off by almost two reps on average. That's pretty accurate. Yeah. So the idea of when you think you you have, you know, just two more, the average person in the gym has 10 more, not supported by this meta-analysis. In fact, it is the opposite. That in fact, uh, every time we experimentally check this and we ask people to, to, hey, go to failure, how many more do you think you can, you can get? It's pretty good. So this is a huge win for Team RIR. Um, however, there is data which suggests that's not maybe the way it's playing out in the real world. Yeah. That if you were to actually go to a gym and grab a bunch of people, ask them, hey, what's your 10RM and what loads do you train with? And then how many reps do you do with it? This is actually something very early on in mass that I found a study where a lot of people are training a lot further from failure than they probably should be. Mm-hmm. And what's up with that, bro, is kind of the uh, like like the essential take home from that. And it, what I'll say is that there's a really big difference between tracking and monitoring and, and writing down your RIRs and actively estimating it versus I'm someone in the gym who trains and then I got brought into a lab and asked what am I, am I doing it right? So literally in the very first issue uh, of mass, uh, I I, I was reviewing this stuff. I reviewed a study by Hackett and colleagues. um, And, uh, you know, I'd found that when people are zero to five reps from failure when performing the machine chest press or the leg press, they're pretty accurate, right? So this data has been mounting for a long time that, you know, people are actually pretty accurate, but that there's a big difference between asking people in a study that, hey, our our goal here is to see how accurate you are tracking your RIR and to experimentally test that versus just observing people in the gym like some of these TikTok videos do. Where they, you know, the guy's on the lap pull down, he finishes, goes, whew, good job. And it's like, nah, bro, you were super far from failure. And that is a thing. And I think that's important. And it, it may very well be the cause of people who aren't making 
the performance gains that they would like to be making or the hypertrophy gains, right? So how do we square these two uh, these these two conflicting findings? And And ultimately, I think it's as simple as saying, this is something you need to pay attention to and giving people a goal. Just saying, hey, you want to make sure that you can only do, you know, zero to three more reps at the end of each of each set. And if they're off by a couple and they're off by, let's say, let's say they're, they're someone who's less accurate than average, they're off by two and they also don't push it as hard as they could. They take your recommendation, they go zero to three, right? So three it is, you know, and they train to a five RAR. That's harder than most people train. And that is probably sufficiently hard for a large part of their career for them to make that progress. So I think it's it's just a really important understanding that those are two different things. And yes, when people are not aware that that is a goal, they don't have a target. You know, what's the old adage? Uh, what's what's measured is managed. Mm. If it's not being measured and it's not being managed, well, sure. You know, you very well might see someone who is training regularly with, you know, the hardest set they do is a five RAR and most of their sets are around six, seven or more. And yeah, that might be why they're, they're, they're not progressing. So I think it's, I think it's important to, 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 to think about that differentiation. So if you want to make the argument that the average gym goer is not training close enough to failure, I'd say 100%. I agree, for sure. Yeah. But if you want to make the argument that bodybuilders would be better off, powerlifters would be better off, athletes would be better off, and that your gym bros who are reading the science and stopping at a 2RAR are leaving out critical gains, I think because they're, A, one, because failure is better, and two, because they're, they're, they're way underestimating their reps, um, training to failure is not way better. In a specific context, it might be a little bit better, and they're probably pretty accurate. They're probably no more at least in the group that we're talking about, people who are tracking it, people who have training experience, they're probably more accurate than that helper meta-analysis. They're probably within a rep most of the time. Yeah. So I think that is something that is a very important distinction um, that is lost a lot of the times. And I will see some people respond to me talking about like that meta-analysis or some other study uh, that is suggesting that people are actually pretty accurate and they go, yeah, well, that's not what I see in the gym, bro. I'm like, those are two different things, you know? And, and who are we talking to? Who, wh what are we talking about? Is your goal to ha to help the average person who probably doesn't even want to be bigger? They're just going to the gym for health to get them to maximize the hypertrophy gains. Or are we actually talking to people who are trying to maximize the hypertrophy gains who are already pretty, pretty accurate and know that failure is important. So I think it is, it, it, it is really like a, uh, a courses for horses scenario. If, if your content is for people who are new to exercise or maybe they've been kind of stuck doing the same routine forever and they don't understand progressive overload, that's a great message because ultimately once someone is focused on progressive overload, they understand that it needs to be sufficiently hard per set. And then even more so if they actually understand RIR as a variable, this will take care of itself. And that's the thing that I really want to push back on is that some people view simply having RIR as a variable, simply quantifying proximity to failure, like sets, like reps, like load, like frequency, like volume, as a bad thing because the assumption should be that you go to failure. Now we're not teaching people about their proximity to failure and they are locked into a specific approach. You actually have to tell them that they need to go to failure. And for some people, that that's a game changer. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to have that experience in the gym. Sure, you you guys love it because you're crazy bodybuilders. And I'll admit I do like training to failure. But that is not what I like. And I need to know what's a reasonable level of effort that I can put in. And if that's if someone can only with only willing to train at a three to five RIR, great news based upon this on this meta series of meta regressions, that's still going to give them a pretty good effect size. But they, but yes, if they weren't training hard enough, that might be actually harder for them. But it might be all that's needed. And telling them to train to failure and not educating them about RIR might make them feel like, well, oh, I'm wasting my time in the gym, but I don't want to do that. It's like, it's not worth the cost. Yeah. And now you've kind of created that meme again of, oh, I have to train like an animal in the gym to get any gains, or I have to train four hours a day. Like either the the kind of the Schwarzenegger camp or the Mike Menser camp, I think it pushes the average person away from getting great health benefits from lifting because they think they either need to go tell gut busting failure on all exercises, doing like crazy eccentrics on deadlifts and, and, and until they throw up, 
or they need to spend, you know, two sessions in the gym per day of the last at least an hour and a half. And neither one is true. Uh, there is actually a very low threshold for volume and a reasonably low threshold for effort where you're getting a pretty reliable effect. And people need to know that there's a dose response. And to know there's a dose response, they have to understand that proximity to failure can be quantified and it, there is a dose like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 RIR. So I, I think it is a, uh, a mistake to tell people, uh, no, don't even worry about RIR, just train to failure because I think it takes the power out of their hands. Eric, come on. Roar, we will have that other episode because this is the preliminary conversation. I certainly do think it will be one of those topics kind of, I anticipate sort of like uh, the ketogenic diet in the last several years, how it resurfaces and because so many people are talking about it, it gets reexamined. And there's always that novelty factor, right? Let's say if people have been hearing one conversation skewed a particular way, and then your favorite fitness influenza starts talking about another, ooh, now it's intriguing. And I do wonder, Eric, the whole concept, of what uh, what did uh, Ben House call it? Dr. Ben House, Mr. Dr. Ben House, uh, like hazard ra uh, ratios as it relates to health. But let's apply yep. that kind of um, as it relates to content and your viewership. I think people will naturally select kind of content that appeals most to them. So they'll, they'll, they'll get their contingent of people that really identify with, oh, I'm training a failure. But one thing I, I like about Iron Culture, the moniker is, you know, for all lifters and the mm -hmm. idea that, you know, depending upon what your goals are, there's a bunch of different approaches that you can take and they can be effective. And this is the reason why some people might choose this one as opposed to that one. And one of the things I couldn't help but think about when you uh, were talking about the relationship as it relates to strength, how actually basically uh, no real difference, if anything, not uh, statistically important, but the idea that if you go closer to RIR, it really de uh, uh, depends to a lower one. Is it going to be beneficial? Doesn't seem to be uh, the case at all, that they'll sometimes bring up the fact that strength athletes are powerlifters. And I think this is the difference within populations. Well, they'll say, oh, they don't train hard because they'll take a look at their training. Like I was at Game Day Barbell as an example recently. And this is the misapplication of some concepts as it relates to different populations. Oh, you want to get swole, man? Oh, you're training three times. You're a novice too? Like you actually don't even know what, uh, no uh, offense attended, like training to failures, but you saw this, you started applying and you get good gains. And now you're uh, giving some commentary on like, Jesus Oliveras, who I had the fortune to train with him. And you'll see, like, no joke, I was there in the trenches, Eric. And that's where I think context is always important and the specificity of what you do as applies to one's own training. I saw this man pull 400 kilograms. And I, I've seen this accusation amongst even, like, I would say decent content creators, like fitness content creators, where they'll talk about the idea, well, because strength athletes, you know, they have to focus on percentages or RPE, they don't really apply themselves on these movements because they always have to be fresh. And thus, that's and that's the, the key there. And thus, that's why they're smaller than people that focus on hypertrophy. I'm like, well, that's like, that's a, an extremely tenuous claim at best. But let's examine this. Uh, Jesus is an example who we're trying to evaluate, as you said, higher percentages and then RIR. I saw this man rip 400 kilograms, rip it off the ground. Now, it was a more humid day, so grip was a factor. But if I had a accurately estimate uh, estimate uh, eric how many more reps he probably could have gotten two to four like maybe two and that's mm. insane like but the velocity of that repetition if someone was to just watch that or his back down work which was i'll say the pounds 800 pounds for i think a double or maybe a triple and again it looks bro like it's an rpe like by the speed he's going it's like an rp3 but he knows because he's an elite level lifter that this is actually exactly what he needs to do. And that actually isn't the RPE of it. And I've seen this time and time again, depending upon the athlete and what they're doing. And so people will see this aspect and then they'll think, oh, how do I apply to something else? And now we're talking about compound movements where it's it's a completely different population. So I like, I like how you framed it. Uh, what I'm saying is that depending upon what your goals are, your availability, your training, like all these factors will determine what you pursue and what ultimately you apply. But I don't like those, how do you say, uh, uh, people sometimes making a, a, a content that isn't an accurate representation of what people are doing and then the results that they uh, have. Absolutely. It's, it's very difficult to say that a powerlifter isn't training hard enough when they're the strongest person on the planet. Like, <laughs> they're obviously tra training hard enough to get to their goal because they have, they're literally atop the peak of powerlifters, right? Like, just imagine man, if he trained hard. He though, only Eric. did a double with six hundred pounds. Like, <laughs> obviously, he's not training hard enough. 
can you do a double with 600 pounds? <laughs> no. You know, like I, I just, obviously like, like there, there's, that, that's a, not a super nuanced comment, but you get what I'm saying. Like yeah. I totally understand. And it's very similar to what I was just talking about. There's a misattribution of what's going on. Yes. A lot of people in the gym don't train hard enough. And then they might say it's because they can't accuracy, ac- accurately gauge their proximity to failure. Yep. No, they can. Yep. They don't want to train to failure. Yeah. That's why they don't yeah. like discomfort. Most people yeah. in the gym are not like you. Yeah. Like the study that I was referring to, which I actually should have named, is self-selected resistance exercise load implications for research and prescription by Bar- 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 by by Barbosa Neto. That's a hard one to say yep. from 2017. And the overall findings was that on average, they chose all these recreationally trained males, and they asked them, "What do you normally do your 10 RM on bench with?" So it's even bench press, like shit the guys like to go to failure on. They yep. said, okay, w- what is your normal load that you train with for 10 reps? And they, and they said, this is my normal load. And they went, okay, cool. Let, let's take that to failure. And on average, they were getting 16 reps with a standard deviation of five, right? So that means the average person is training to a six RIR with bench press. And that's like, oh my God, is that because they can't track proximity to failure? No, it's because they're not trying hard because they don't like the way that feels or perhaps they don't know that that's a, that they have to train a certain level of difficulty. But based upon the data we have, like I said, as soon as they're instructed to actually track it and they're observed and they have spotters and equivalent of training partners around them, all of a sudden they get more accurate. So the issue is that, yeah, people don't like discomfort and having a more positive association with training appropriately hard would be a good thing. Yeah. But I don't think yelling at them that they're wussies and that they need to go all the way to failure and pass to get any gains is going to solve that problem. It's just going to make the thing that they're trying to achieve seem, seem even more unattainable rather than setting them stepwise goals. Like, oh, did you know you're actually training like to a to a eight RIR most of the time? Let's just do three more reps. Like that would be a progressive overload mm-hmm. in, an imp- in like a huge improvement. So like in this sample... 40% of people were training at a six RIR or higher, right? But it's also important to note that 50% were training at a five RIR or lower, you know, and they're probably totally fine, you know, depending on what they're doing with their volume, their exercise technique, technique, all that other stuff. And I bet if you were to, to do a secondary analysis of this study, like, you know, what's the difference between the people who normally do 10 to 12 reps with their, you know, their, their, their ten, with, with their, what they think is their 10 RM load and the people who are doing 19 to 20, how long have they been doing it? What are their goals? How serious are they? And have they been taught about proper training? Do they have a workout partner? So yeah, I- exactly the same thing. Uh, the, I- the idea that um, powerlifters aren't training hard enough, even though they're world champions because they're not going to failure or that people are not training hard enough because they don't know how hard they they don't know they, like they can't gauge how close they are to failure. It's two very different things. The people who are powerlifters are intentionally training the way they're training because they have a certain goal. And the people who are not training hard enough in the gym are not bodybuilders or powerlifters and maybe don't know that they're supposed to train that hard. Not necessarily that. Oh no, I definitely went to failure because they didn't ask them in that study. Did mm-hmm. you think you went to failure? They just asked them, "What do you normally do for ten reps?" Got it. So I think that's a really important distinction. And I have seen this study mischaracterized a number of times as people think they're going to failure, but then they're actually actually do 16 reps and watched. No, they were never asked if they thought they were going to failure. They asked them, what do you do for 10 reps? Yep. Not necessarily, what is your 10 rep max? They did not ask them what their 10 rep max is. So I think um, that is a an often mischaracterized problem, but you can still keep your meme of people don't work hard enough. Because it's true. It's, yeah. I mean, it's true, right? Yeah. Like, um, but uh, the, the real question you should be asking yourself is what needs to occur to get people to work harder? And I don't think it's like variations on, on Goggins, you know? <laughs> don't be a bitch, try harder. Like, what's the solution to not trying hard enough? Fucking try harder and don't be a bitch. Like, okay. Like, no, yeah. when, when does that ever work? That The people who like that stuff yeah. are the people who identify as people who work really hard. Mm-hmm. And just because you're saying something that's true, like identifying a problem is not the same thing as solving it. And that's basically all the people who are are just parading on about you need to bust your ass and work hard. Like that is a truism. What's the tool? How do you do that? Are you useful? You're not. You're, you're just saying things that, 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 is, that is, the sky is blue. Yes. Yeah, so what? Yeah. Like, you know what? Like, 
if just simply telling people to work harder would have solved the obesity epidemic or mm-hmm. or, or the health consequences or made everyone into elite athletes, it would have already happened. It's not just the knowledge of it. And if it's just, you know, you're go figure it out. Like, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're <laughs> a genius, you know? So I, I am uh, obviously highly critical of that type of messaging because as a trainer for mm-hmm. years and years and years, uh, and, and the start of my career was with the general population, that was the only, it was, I'm not even going to call it a tool. That'd be too generous. I didn't know how to tell people to work hard. I just told them they needed to. And when they didn't do it, I just got mad at them. And honestly, if that's all you can do as a trainer, you need to get another job. Mm-hmm. Eric, come on now, man. I, I cannot wait for that next episode in the near future discussing this one i also can't wait for the misinterpretation of uh some of the stuff from this meta-analysis just uh, once again as it percolates down into the space it's coming coming. oh yeah and i think that's why we we decided to talk about it today because you can you could just anticipate it similar to the previous episode with uh trex and then as it relates to uh bmr and then uh, the fatty acid source and like what people would read and what they interpret from it. And it almost, it's more an indication what you say about something like this, like your comprehension level of what's going on than actually what the study found or, or, or the, the results that are being discussed. The number one Helms quote for me is that identifying a problem is not the same as providing a solution. Because I think within that is a kernel of everything that you're discussing or, or what people would put forth or advocate for and the whys um, that, that sometimes it, it is weird where someone will, and I think that's my only personal issue from being involved in the space is not people that train a failure, uh, not people that identify that they like that methodology, but it's everything that is associated with it. And then it, it's more like a philosophical outlook on life. And then they find something that fits their training style. And that's once again, that's okay. But to me, it always becomes interesting when you have conversations then about strength or the idea of once again like they it, just imagine how much bigger he would be bro if he just took that shit to failure like he thinks he knows how to train i'm like i will pay you right like forget the squat in the way just unrack it as uh zach there's that uh, uh yeah. a video with Great zach teller yeah where he unracked a thousand pounds now he he did it at a you know there's like a three inch unrack i'd pay you like 500 bucks to unrack a thousand pounds and just walk it out don't lift it just walk it out and that's <laughs> that's some knee snapping action um, yeah 500 bucks would not cover the hospital bill <laughs> yeah well yeah yeah we, we uh, sign this disclaimer but i will say that uh maybe my last point eric and what i'm always just acutely aware of is the idea that sometimes some of these things are smoke screens and what i mean when i say that there is and this is not god i i sound like that dude but 2013 Omar was also saying the same thing. I think I've now been around the fitness space long enough to see things come in cycles. And the thing that I'm seeing too, and this sounds like a heavy accusation, but keep in mind uh, too, I won't say the facilities I was at recently, not Austin Game Day Barbell, but another one where sometimes behind closed doors, people will disclose certain things to you. And because, you know, it's said in private, like, why am I obviously going to say anything publicly? Um, But it's kind of like, as you expect. And all I mean when I say that is that some of the people that are advocating for either train to failure or like, I didn't know this until I unlocked that. The difference that we're seeing in their physique over a short period of time is not attributed to what they've changed with their training and the whole element, Eric, which think about it, there is now, I'm actually surprised there's not more people that are enhanced claiming to be natural. Now, I, to be honest, I'm actually surprised it's not more prevalent in the space because the rewards, and we, like I discussed this in 2013, the idea of someone, you know, again, enhanced, but they're within the realm because they're using a low dose or whatnot, where they look like they could be natural. So to an outsider, not a do witch hunt, who knows, right? Who knows better? Uh, uh, who can say? But because the rewards are there, I, I can think of three people in particular. One one who I know from, I'll just say secondary sources, it doesn't matter, that I, that I believe this person is in fact uh, enhanced. And again, that's not an accusation, but you've been around the space, you have these conversations. I've seen this cycle uh, a bunch, pun intended. But anyways, uh, the, what amuses me, Eric, is what they'll choose to attribute as as if like they're preaching the gospel, the muscle church gospel to their disciples. And instead of just blurting out the truth, they're trying to show you that new thing. And I can't help but feel that in a space where everything in quotations becomes known, novelty becomes a huge factor. And so you you start reviving certain things, right? There's a reason why 
almost, you know, Arnold for a long time, revered, rightly so, as a bodybuilding figure. We talked about physiques, right? Who are some of the people? Like we could say Reg Park, but like Frank Zane, the golden era physique. And now they've found their new avatar potentially with Mike Mentzer. Like this guy, once again, he's kind of an iconoclast, right? He's off the beaten path in terms of what he would do, what he would say. His physique, we take a look at his physique, kind of that, that appeal to smallness as we talk about. So there's so many things coming together. And I like the idea that we're participating actively in this space, Eric. We talk about the next generation. We talk about Zach actually doing the damn thing, communicating with people, and then the influence that it could bring. I just cannot wait to see where we are now, especially in the space. This meta analysis, what's going on, like, like, like Milo with some of the research, like length and partial. It's just, I think, I, I genuinely think not that things were uh, frozen for a while, but I think we're in a very exciting space because now we're dynamically interacting with the greater culture and you could see some of these trends and you could see some of those applications and you see over time how there's a certain portion of people that become more for lack of a better term like science inclined and they start pursuing research and then they kind of uh uh you know reverberate back down the chain new information so it's just exciting man i 100 percent agree it's just really cool to see um bodybuilders and powerlifters getting involved in research because they want to ask and answer questions and <laughs> connecting it directly to the communities we're trying to serve uh, and it really kind of turns the pencil neck meme on its head and it squashes the very unhelpful false dichotomy of it being experience versus research mm -hmm. which really leaves you half informed in either way so no i i totally agree um and it's it's an exciting time to be alive and I love that we're always getting a little more right on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's go, Eric. Eric, where can people find you? You can find me sitting in my <laughs> office, the same spot every single time, with you constantly changing location and backgrounds mm -hmm. every single insert date here. Oh, man. Well, I want to uh, thank you once again for being on Iron Culture. You could check out Eric also on Mass Monthly Applications and Strength Sports. We'll link that in the description. Shout out to Kai. If you want a, to leave a rating and review, iTunes once again, Spotify, get your shit together. We'll read those reviews. We have several hundred. We always enjoy reading them, whether they're one star, which is exceptionally rare, or five star, which is exceptionally common. We will read them. We are back every single insert date here from now until the end of time. We'll catch you in that next episode.